It's wonderful to see everyone here. Uh, I'm Patricia Davidson. I have the honour and privilege of being the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Wollongong. And it's great to welcome each and every one of you here today. Our Luminary Series brings together researchers, industry experts and thought leaders for a one hour conversation every two weeks. And today we welcome our colleagues and collaborators from a number of institutions, not just here in Australia, but across the globe, um, and who are coming together to discuss a really important issue in how we engage um, diverse populations and meet their healthcare needs. And this is a very topical conversation because this week is Palliative Care Week in Australia, where the spotlight is on the critical needs of people living with serious life-limiting illness. But before we start the conversation today, I want to acknowledge country. On behalf of the University of Wollongong, I'd like to acknowledge that country for Aboriginal peoples is an interconnected set of ancient and sophisticated relationships. The University of Wollongong spreads across many interrelated Aboriginal countries that are bound by this sacred landscape and intimate relationship with that landscape since creation. From Sydney to the Southern Highlands, to the South Coast, from freshwater to bit of water to salt, from city to urban to rural. The University of Wollongong acknowledges the custodianship of the Aboriginal peoples of this place and space that has kept alive the relationship between all living things. Our university also acknowledges the devastating impact of colonization on our campus's footprint and commit ourselves to truth-telling, healing and education. So again, welcome everybody. Um, to the, tonight we have a, a panel of experts and let me uh, introduce them to you tonight. Firstly, it's an honor to welcome Dr. Dulce Cruz Oliver, Dulce is an assistant professor of palliative care at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore in the United States. She's a physician gerontologist and palliative care physician. And Dulce's work is highly innovative because it empowers Latino family caregivers and health professionals in caring for seriously ill family members by promoting innovative research and education. Welcome Dulce to Australia, and it's fabulous to have you here on this panel. Also joining the panel uh, today, uh, we have Associate Barb Davidson from the University of Wollongong. And Barb has expertise in palliative care, implementation sciences, and outcome measurement. She is the director of the Palliative Care Outcomes Program, which is funded by the Australian government. And it is a national palliative care outcomes program that aims to improve uh, outcomes for Australians. Barb has a commitment to improving the quality of care and outcomes of patients and families, particularly those at risk of experiencing negative outcomes in care. It's really fabulous to have two of our colleagues here today from the University of Technology, Sydney. Um, Associate Professor Michelle de Giacomo is an Associate Professor within IMPACT, which is the uh, uh, Collaborative Research Centre titled Improving Palliative and Aged and Chronic Care Through Clinical Research and Translation. Michelle has a background in health psychology and behavioural health. And it's also fabulous to have with us uh, Dr. Ryan Sala Musa, who is a postdoctoral research fellow with expertise in um, cancer symptom trials. Her work at the moment is focused on improving the preclinical to clinical pipeline through multidisciplinary translational research, focusing on cancer symptom therapeutics. And currently, Ryan is leading a project to investigate the underrepresentation of culturally and linguistically diverse communities in clinical research. So as you can see, we've got an exceptional panel with a diverse range of experience. Uh, the format of this afternoon is that we will ask um, Dr. Cruz Oliver to maybe just provide a little bit of a context of her work, um, which will be particularly interesting 
to ask um, because the, we have a small uh, population of Latinx peoples here in Australia. So it'll be exciting to hear from her. And um, I've been hearing from my colleagues who she's already spoken to a lot of excitement around leveraging the telenovela methodology. Um, I would also really encourage people to ask their own questions using the Q&A function. Um, I will monitor that and we'll try and get through as many questions as possible. But now um, let's get started. Um, I now like to hand over uh, to Dulce, who will speak to her uh, to us about her research. And I'm really excited to hear, you know, how a palliative care physician um, uses telenovelas uh, to improve patient care. So over to you, Dulce. Thank you. Thank you, Trish, for having me. And um, I want to welcome First Nations people in the audience. And um, it's so uh, amazing to be here sharing uh, my work, integrating telenovelas into hospice and palliative care for ethnically diverse family caregivers. And when I say hospice, I want to make uh, I want to clarify that in the states, hospice is an equivalent to receiving palliative care the last six months of life here in Australia. So just wanted to uh, make that clear when I'm referred to hospice is the last six months of um, of palliative care here. Now, if I would like to spend the next few minutes just sharing my story. Um, how I came to develop a, a telenovela and the preliminary results of, of, of one of them. And if you don't remember anything I say, remember this, this is my headline, video education through telenovela is a promising tool for ethnically diverse family caregivers. And what this means is that caregivers need education uh, through videos to have a better caregiving experience. Now, the, my story, why, how did I make, became interested in family caregivers was thanks to my grandma, Mita, and my aunt, Tia. Uh, Tia was the main caregiver of Mita in the last 10 years of her life. She lived until 103. And she, I, I saw my Tia going through the ups and downs of being a caregiver. And she had the most uh, hardest time for her was, the hardest thing for her was to accept professional help. And it got me thinking, how can we help better help caregivers um, keep their loved one at home? And certainly there, there are, especially keep their, uh, their loved one at home for ethnically diverse family caregivers. And certainly there are still health disparities either because it's, clinical case is different because um, the access of healthcare is, is very is, is different as well. Not everybody has insurance. And thirdly, because the patient provider interaction is, is variable. And this last factor is the factor that is modifiable and is the one that I am more, most interested in, in helping with. By and my proposal is to use videos to educate and support family caregivers, but specifically the a, a video format that is telenovela, which is what Trish was referring to. So a telenovela, uh, for those of you that are not familiar with that, is a is a story. Okay, so it's the semi is is a the the right translation in English is soap opera. And they are very popular in Latin America. But the telenovela, the difference between a soap opera and telenovelas, the telenovelas are very dramatic and they have a beginning and an end. And they, they convey a message. So then I decided to use this to portray a message to for family caregivers. So um, now I'm going to tell you how I, I came to de develop one of them is the title of this one is To Care and the Spanish version is El Privilegio de Cuidar. So this telenovela specifically, I developed it for as a part of a diversity supplement to the access trial. And this trial, it was, it, it's, was a ro cluster randomized control trial that had three arms, a control arm, 
uh, online Facebook arm and an online Facebook arm, online Facebook uh, support group. That's what I mean. Online Facebook support group plus having the caregiver participate in a, in the care plan meeting. So what I want to draw your attention is the online Facebook support group because that's the portion of the trial that had an education component and the investigators developed origin um, videos for this education component and the videos they used were video recorded PowerPoints, but people were not watching it at all. So we decided to use these original videos and convert this into a telenovela story. And the topics of these videos were taken from feedback from family caregivers. Uh, we, uh, these investigators did uh, ask caregivers, what is it that you would like to know uh, or that we, you will have loved to know be, before being enrolled in hospice and things like that. So the topics uh, were identified were self-care, lessons about hospice, pain assessments, social support, shared decision-making, and the final journey. So we took these six uh, topics and, and created this four-chapter telenovela. And we decided to do a, a proof of concept at study. So we, with 39 participants from the access trial, so we, and we use YouTube analytics to look at the viewing time. And we also use the exit interviews. So in terms of the viewing time, those people, we had 18 people that observed the original videos and we had 21 that, that watched the telenovela. And when you compare the viewing time, those, the viewing time of those that observed the telenovela was 12% higher compared to the original videos. And when you compare the interviews, those that observed the telenovelas had more content recall. They also had better, um, they, they, they described the telenovela as very informative and they also identify follow-up actions. For example, one nurse report, one nurse, sorry, one participant reported that she, uh, she did discuss uh, the use of morphine with the family caregiver and with the with the hospice staff. So think about it this way: the the use of telenovela in hospice setting is a pro, it um, shows significant promise as a mode of educating caregivers, but its online delivery was suboptimal because many of them identify time constraints. So even though the viewing time of those that got to observe it was higher, the, um, not that many people watched it. So we decided to go back and ask the hospice staff, how can we make this available to, to the caregivers? And they suggested that we show the telenovelas with, um, with, through the hospice staff in person. They suggested we show the telenovela in person. So then we, um, and one of the examples that they gave us was you should uh, the chaplain or the social worker when they were when they are doing their visit, they, if there is a concern that comes up, they can watch the video and then have a discussion. So the whole point was to be to do it with the hospice staff, because in that way, if they have questions, they can have this discussion. So we took all this information, we created an intervention called Novella, it's the short name of telenovela. And basically, this is just adding the telenovela to care to what already hospice provides. And our theory is that by uh, the, he providing the information that the novela gives, it improves self-efficacy and this will reduce anxiety. So this is from Bandura Social Cognitive Theory that links uh, improvement in self-efficacy to reductions of anxiety. So we were able to pilot test this using a pre and post test. And, um, and the, we, this was done in the times of COVID. So we wanted to do it in person, but we converted that to uh, video conferencing. So we used Zoom. So we had an interventionist watching the ten with a, a one family caregiver watching the telenovela. So the intervention was basically the interventionist introduced the video, then they they shared the screen and watched the telenovela together, and then there was a discussion afterwards. And this was 
This lasted around 15 minutes each, and it was done weekly. And we had um, our primary outcome was anxiety. And we set out to recruit 55 uh, family caregivers. We ended up recruiting 59 of those 53 uh, watch uh, started the intervention and 33 observed all four videos. And just to give you an idea, three quarters of these uh, participants were female, mostly caring for their spouse or their parent. And they were 68% of them were Caucasian and a quarter of them were African American. So um, and now I'm going to move on to the to the pre preliminary results of this. So we looked at the first 20 interviews, and basically just to summarize it, this um, the the interviews show that the the caregivers found this acceptable and feasible. And I want to share with you one of the quotes. So your video was like make him comfortable, be able to support what is going on but just make sure the primary objective is to be comfortable, end quote. So we also looked at the quantitative data, meaning if it changed self-efficacy and anxiety. And we did saw that both scores went into the, went the right direction. It was not significant, but it went the right direction and their, the effect size was small. So we decided to do like a post hoc analysis to find out if any of the baseline characteristics influence this, this uh, small change. And we did found that those that observed three or four videos did better, had a significant change in anxiety and self-efficacy score compared to those that observe two or less videos. So what this means is that the caregivers need to watch at least two videos to have a, some benefit from the novella intervention. So I would like to close with my headline again, um, video education through telenovela is a promising tool for ethnically diverse family caregivers. And that's that, I'll, I'll give it back to Trish. Thanks so much, Dulce. And um, some of the really powerful messages that I, I think came from your description was, you know, the power of storytelling in conveying health information, the importance of co-design and co-production. And also, um, as we develop these interventions, we have to think about the theoretical aspects. Um, so, Ram, can I turn to you? Um, because I think, you know, traditionally people from culturally and linguistically diverse um, backgrounds don't get included in many sort of traditional studies. And I think Dulce's work really targeting in particular the, the Latinx uh, population and also caregivers, which who are commonly afterthoughts in many studies. Um, Ryan, I'd be really interested to hear about your work and your study population and what has been some of your observations to really get at hard to reach groups? Thank you, Patricia. Um, so for those not familiar, um, I work with the Cancer Symptom Trials uh, Collaborative based at UTS. And um, I'm currently leading a, um, a program trying to understand uh, what the barriers and enablers are of um, cold participants um, accessing cancer clinical trials with a specific focus on the Arabic speaking community. And hopefully what we plan to do is expand to other um, communities. Um, in terms of, so we are still very early, um, early stages of this particular research. Um, uh, and I, I do welcome anyone in the audience who is uh, a healthcare professional or a research staff that um, deals with Arabic speaking um, people from, with cancer to please contact me as we do have focus groups uh, currently running. Um, <clears throat> What I will speak to, and, and I, I will have a little disclaimer, I apologize if anyone has heard me speak in the last few months because a lot of what I'm gonna say is has been said before, um, is that it's important to point out that there are 
many factors contributing to this underrepresentation of cult communities. However, the literature has placed this heavy focus on the patient-sided barriers, such as health literacy and language, and largely ignored the bigger picture. And that includes things like the sponsor and site level barriers, as well as the broader systemic um, barriers. Um, and I want to come back to those in a moment, but just to briefly touch on two points regarding the patient level. Firstly, I feel that we as an industry need to shift our mindset. And rather than thinking of language as a barrier, we should be approaching this as a need that we are not meeting. And that uh, what that does is almost shift that um, unspoken responsibility. So we researchers and healthcare professionals uh, need to provide culturally and linguistically appropriate support and resources to people from these communities. The second point is that this tendency to hyper-focus on language and give very little consideration for the cultural and spiritual influence when it comes to decision-making around new treatments or participating in clinical trials. So um, individuals like myself who are uh, from cult communities and can speak English fluently will still have these cultural and spiritual needs that will influence our decision um, to participate in your trial. So, I mean, whilst translating materials or having an interpreter on hand will address the language needs of this of our communities, um, if your study has not taken into account these cultural spiritual sensitivities um, that you wish to recruit from, then you run into some potential uh, feasibility issues. Um, and these aspects can only be truly appreciated and addressed through early, meaningful and ongoing engagement with the community that you wish to serve. Um, just very quickly, I will provide, I guess, some key um, practical steps that can help us start to address the sponsor site level and broader systemic barriers. Um, and in doing so, this will allow for a more holistic change in the Australian clinical trial uh, landscape. Um, so firstly, embracing diversity within your teams, be it your clinical team or your research team. Um, and a very quick exercise that you can all do is survey your current research and site staff and just look at how diverse are your teams currently. Do you need to build cultural awareness and competence within your teams? What are the in-house community connections and language skills that you can leverage from? And how can we provide opportunities or upskill individuals from cult communities such as myself that work in health or research to be more involved in clinical research and academia? What are the opportunities that we can create for these individuals to progress into leadership roles? There is so much fear and mistrust towards the health and research field. And part of this is due to the lack of diversity. And in previous talks, I've shared that um, in the Arabic community, the word for Westerner or white person is Ajnabi. And if you look at the um, exact meaning of Ajnabi, it actually translates to foreigner. So there is already this mistrust that we don't identify with people from, from the Western world as someone that we can trust just by that using that particular word. Um, another uh, point, a practical step would be to review your procedures and to plan ahead. So um, keep diversity and inclusion front of mind when you're drafting your research protocols and do not use that default exclusion criteria of non-English speaking. Um, and when I say plan ahead, I mean, for example, work out what are the specific activities that you will need to carry out or what measures you will need in place in order to be able to recruit and retain um, cold participants. For instance, you want to include community engagement activities or translation services. Um, at the site level, clinicians and staff often report time pressure as a major issue. So perhaps you want to include patient navigators in your trial design. Another example would be to um, select uh, assessment tools or patient reported outcomes that are available and translated in val um, translated and validated versions. Um, and, and they do exist if you look for them. Um, and in planning ahead, you want to make sure that you've accounted for the associated costs and um, that you're including these in your funding budgets. Um, so these activities and measures should not be an afterthought. It will make things a lot easier if you 
think of them ahead of time. And finally, um, community engagement is, as you, um, as Dulce um, spoke uh, about, um, this is absolutely critical and it is a process and it takes so much time. It takes weeks to years, um, even as, you know, with myself leading my current project, I need to put in the effort and time to get to know my community better because I don't represent everyone. Um, so allow the time to engage with the community you wish to serve, develop those strong and meaningful um, partnerships as early on as possible and involve the community in every stage of your research. Um, do, not, um, do not approach the community with predetermined priorities and solutions a few weeks out of submitting your grants. So take the time to listen to their needs, their priorities and generate those solutions together. Um, and so, yeah, I guess I, I urge each and every one of you to go back to your teams and begin to take these very simple steps towards improving the representation and um, equitable, equitable access and participation of cult communities within your research programs. Sorry, I, I rambled on for quite a bit, Patricia. No, you didn't. I ran. You made some really excellent points because, you know, we often think about the healthcare workforce should reflect, um, you know, the social and demographic characteristics of the populations we serve, but we don't necessarily um, focus as much on what our study uh staff or our research teams look like and you know I think you gave a very powerful uh, message that just excluding people because they're non-English speaking is a is a cop-out and is something that we just can't um, uh, really tolerate anymore and again your theme of respect um, relationships and co-creation co-production was another thing coming coming through um, very strongly. Um, Michelle, if I could turn to you and and talk about, you know, what are some of the best methods to engage in evaluation or getting the voice of people from culturally and linguistically diverse groups? <clears throat> Dulce gave an excellent example of her study, which had both quantitative and qualitative dimensions. But, you know, um, I know uh, Michelle has done a lot of work in hard to reach populations. So Michelle, some of your methodological insights would be really useful in, in this conversation. Sure, thanks. Um, I think much like what Dulce has spoken about, um, she centered her, her approach was about a story and that is what draws people in. Um, and that was very engaging. Um, for the participants to, to watch and listen um, to people going through maybe what they're going through. So she spoke about making people feel comfortable. That's what a participant said. And also, you know, normalizing issues that people are going through um, because as we know, caregivers can feel quite isolated, um, taking on a lot of responsibilities, uh, having to make decisions sometimes on their own, feeling a bit well, not a bit, but very overwhelmed with the gravity of these decisions. Um, so I think it's so powerful, the story and letting people tell their stories. So um, that's uh, something I prioritize in the types of research that I do. Um, letting people um, certainly um, tell the story, what, what their experience has been. This can be through interviews, you know, semi-structured interviews, where you might have a few things in mind that you want to um, uh, highlight and get people to respond to, but also uh, you know, letting people progress as the natural um, path of the, their experience. Um, uh, focus groups are another um, appropriate way for many groups to uh, get together and talk. Um, I think focus groups are really helpful when you want uh, people to interact and converse and respond to each other. Um, and it might make people feel quite a bit more comfortable uh, rather than a one-on-one face-to-face -on -one -face kind of, you know, maybe less intimidating if they feel like they can speak in a group with other people who have had a similar experience. Um, 
And I think um, Dulce also mentioned the online face group or uh, support groups. And that's another kind of approach that's in, you know, increasingly innovative and you know, gets rid of the access issues um, and lets people join in. I think there are positives and negatives to that approach, um, but it's, it's another way of bringing the people together to um, enable them to share their stories and get support and, and learn a bit from one another. So those are some of my key favorites. Thanks so much, Michelle. Um, Bob, if I can sort of uh, turn to you, um, you lead this huge initiative, Peacock. Um, can you maybe comment, maybe give people a little bit of background who may be not as familiar with Peacock, but also, you know, maybe describe some of the strategies that you use to make sure that this very rich um, database is representative of the population? Yeah, um, look, thank you, Trish, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. And it's lovely to be joining the other panellists to discuss this really important issue. So the Palliative Care Outcomes Program is a national palliative care program within Australia. It's led by the University of Wollongong. And it, the model's been replicated now in a number of countries internationally. Um, our primary aim is to systematically improve patient outcomes and care outcomes. And we, we have a wonderful collaboration with the services, the palliative care services across the country to enable this national initiative. The focus is on quality improvement. We also have as a byproduct of this national initiative, large data sets. Um, and we, we're in a fortunate position as well to be able to pull together um, information about different culturally and linguistically diverse groups in order to start to work with different groups to, um, to progress uh, improvements in the ways that we serve these populations. Um, Tricia, key aspect of our work is actually to also collaborate with government representatives and influence policy. And when I think about the topic today about chronic disease and uh, underserved populations and think about what can we do to improve uh, policy. Um, there are a couple of things that come to my mind and a number of the other panelists have already spoken to this to some degree, um, but patient reported outcomes are key to our national program. And this is extremely important when we're looking at health systems performance metrics. Um, many countries may be focusing on process measures and utilisation measures, but we know that that does not necessarily equate to good outcomes. So in Peacock, patient reported outcomes remain key to what we're doing. Um, another initiative that we are enabling through Peacock and through the University of Wollongong in relation to palliative care is looking at improved coordination, collaboration and collective effort. Why is it in Australia and also in other countries that we still lack national criteria for referrals to specialist palliative care. Why is this problem about distinguishing between primary palliative care and specialist palliative care still, um, an there's an elusive answer to that problem. So through the Peacock program and other initiatives, we're looking at trying to address that in collaboration with key stakeholders. Um, it allows us as well as a program to move towards population-based approaches. And there's been some wonderful work that's been done in Australia, in, in particular in the first decade, first two decades of the turn of this century, um, through this, the Omnibus Survey in Australia, in South Australia. And what that work did was really start to illuminate some of the unmet needs and experiences of caregivers at scale. So many of the methodologies that we use to estimate need at a population level for palliative care populations are derived from disease-specific um, approaches. And they, they haven't yet accounted for preferences or effectiveness. Um, and so there's an opportunity for population-based approaches. And this is what we are moving towards in Peacock. We capture about 25% of all expected deaths in the country. Um, so we're in a wonderful position to try and move forward with progressing at, at, at scale some solutions and interrogate 
um, some of the problems, the intractable problems to address. And of course, we we're doing this, we need to continue to do this in collaboration with experts by experience, the patients, public, and the caregivers. So thank you for the question, Trish. Well, thanks, Barb. And I think you've shifted the conversation in a very important way, <clears throat> pardon me, is that uh, much of the research done is, is disease specific, but yet really we're living in an era of multimorbidity. And, um, and the focus of, of today's seminar is just not on um, culturally and linguistically diverse populations, but specifically those in chronic and aged care. Um, Dulce, can I maybe ask you, uh, particularly in, in your work, um, working with older people towards the end of life, how does culture um, influence the spiritual aspects and the process of living with a life-limiting illness? How does the culture influence um, the care they received and, and or, or the care that that individuals need and want? Yeah, so it it does influence quite a bit, uh, specifically uh, the way they see the the healthcare, the way they they see, the way they believe, um, the way they believe they should be the treatment they should be receiving or not. For example, I, I, your, uh, this question makes me think of the various uh, patients that have uh, confided to me that, Doctor, I am I I appreciate your help, but I'm going to my home country and get healed by a by a specific person. And I am uh, or others that come to me and tell me that uh, they 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 appreciate and they will take the blood pressure medication but they they want to still take uh, x or y supplement so those are um cultural cultural beliefs on natural things that they are that are part of their own country and their own tradition and is um and is uh, up to the provider to to op to be open to those uh kind of interventions and to also uh, be in the lookout for those that probably are harmful or that may be interacting with other medications, other treatments. But however, it is, it's important to have this curiosity and this honesty with, uh, with our patients uh, that, that this is, um, that it is, so for example, I am very open with my patients and I, and, and I try to make, to, to make them um, comfortable in sharing this with me, not everybody does, but they, the those that I do, that do is really uh, rewarding. Thank you. Also, Susan. in terms of religion, there are there are other factors there, but I, I will I will stop there. Yeah, well, I answer. think you know, I think it think it is important to think about spiritual and religious beliefs, particularly. As this is Palliative Care Week, and um, and um, those beliefs often become more powerful and meaningful as people enter the later stages of life. Uh, Ryan, I'd be interested in your thoughts and views on that topic, and um, particularly uh, in my uh, work with some Middle Eastern populations where disclosure is an issue, and people say. Please don't tell my mum she's dying. Um, how um, in your work, which is really important in cancer symptom management, how do you approach those complex issues? Um, bring my microphone down. Um, uh, just before I get to that, just very quickly to touch on, on the spiritual aspect, um, especially being a, a practicing Muslim, uh, just something to, to bring to everyone's attention. In the Islamic faith, we're taught that our, our body is on loan, a, a temporary vessel, and that we must protect and preserve um, in its as, as much as possible in its natural form. So um, 
health complications are often viewed um, as a test from God, but also a blessing because it's a cleansing of one's sins and that this is almost a, a, um, a stepping stone to um, the afterlife. Now, um, coming back to how do we approach these complex situations in cancer symptoms, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I have not had to face these situations yet, but I guess what the way I would approach it is to try and understand why the family is withholding that information. Um, and if it is, you know, coming from a family who's unfortunately been touched by cancer one too many times, um, in some situations it's been because the, the, uh, the anxiety that it would cause outweighs the benefit of that person knowing, especially if it was quite an advanced stage. Um, and that, for instance, my grandmother, there was nothing the doctors could do for her. It, she was, it was very late by the time they discovered she had cancer. Um, so just making her as comfortable as possible and, and leaving it at that just so that she would not have that added anxiety towards the end of her life. So it's more about preserving whatever quality of life we could um, towards the end of her life. Um, yeah, so I think just trying to understand the reasons why families do not want to share that information um, and, and approaching it from that aspect. Um, I yeah. think, Ryan, I think you've given us some really powerful information. Thank you for sharing you. that understanding of the Muslim faith. I think that is that is really important to know and really highlighting the importance of, you know, understanding from a cultural um, and spiritual perspective why people do what they do. Um, Michelle, can I, can I turn to you um, and just maybe ask you, you know, what do you think are some of the more complex issues, uh, particularly to engage, you know, older participants? I know you did a really great study um, looking at widows um, and, you know, accessing them to res for research took some innovative approaches. Um, um, so maybe you could share some of the recruitment approaches that you used? Yeah, um, just thinking back, um, it, was, it was difficult, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> we tried a few different methods. We tried um, just, you know, straight public advertising of the study um, in local newspapers and things like that. It wasn't an online-based thing, but we did distribute a recruitment advertisement through um, some large, um, I think it was Australia Policy Online back in the day. And we also uh, thought about where or who might interface or interact with older women. Um, and in, I think we sent it to, um, uh, through the, a general practice newsletter throughout New South Wales. And, and we got a few participants there where uh, general practitioners um, read that piece in the uh, newsletter and they um, knew of people. They thought of some of their patients and they thought, oh, this person might want to participate in something like this. Um, I, yeah, I think it was really challenging, but I, I, I'm, can't remember some of the other um, ways we went about it. It can be quite difficult, isn't it? So recruiting uh, older people, and maybe if you if you're not relying on the online or Facebook type um, approaches, but I'd be interested to hear what other people. Yeah. Thought. So um, so uh, Bob, from your experience, I know Peacock is a you know people are impatient, but you've had a huge amount of experience. You know, how do you go about, you know, basically getting people into clinical studies that are going to represent the populations that we serve? Uh, yeah, it's a really um, interesting question. Thank you, Trish. And and I, I suppose part of the key is to make sure that you co-design. 
-hmm. So it's about collaboration and listening and developing methods to enable and improve recruitment rates from the get-go because you're understanding what people's lived experiences are, what their cultural barriers are. The earlier point about it's not people that have a language problem, it's us. Yeah. But aren't shifting our perspective to understand we've got a moral, ethical, clinical imperative to make sure that our clinical resources are translated and fit for purpose. So part of that, it's not a hard to reach population. It's that we actually need to immerse ourselves and try to understand people's culture and lived experiences and acknowledge that there are very legitimate reasons of why some people choose to hide their authentic self, choose to not represent perhaps their full cultural identity or other parts of their identity for fear of ongoing discrimination and racism and, and other terrible things that unfortunately still happen in our health systems today. And uh, it, part of the legacy I, I suspect with clinical trial methodologies and so on is that they the methodologies that we've used or RCTs and so on, were developed at a time where our understanding about the importance of culturally responsive and culturally safe care wasn't as well articulated as it's starting to be now. And also the notion of sovereignty. So in Peacock, we are moving more to patient sovereignty of their own data. What about an Indigenous data sovereignty and agenda? where we are truly being led by some of the major subgroups in different populations to make sure that we are also operating in a safe way, an informed way, and a responsive way, and a sensible way. So taking more of a health equity lens to every part of study design, execution, implementation, and interpretation. So thinking about what we say, why we're saying it, how we're saying it, and what is left unsaid. So these aspects are critically important. Thank you, Trish. Well, well, thanks, Barb, for that very powerful answer. And I was, I really invite people to put some uh, questions in the Q&A for the panel, but there's already one there for you, Barb. Um, um, and the question is, you know, how should social determinants of health be considered in providing health care? Well, that's an excellent question. Thank you so much uh, for whoever has volunteered the question. Um, can the services that we collaborate with and help lead the program um, often remind us of the important of ho importance of holistic care and patient-centered care. And part of that is actually understanding and recognizing and being able to integrate into care plans and treatment the complexities and realities of people's lives. So acknowledging, identifying, and dare I say it, also measuring and quantifying so that we can address it, is the social determinants of health. Um, so one thing that we're doing in the Peacock program, and this will be our new collection that comes forward um, in the next year or so, is also making sure that we're supporting services to adequately assess social determinants of health at the start of their care journey with the service. So what we're doing is we've reviewed the ICD-11 codes and mapped out different types of social determinants of health, which should align with um, uh, spiritual problems um, and psychological challenges that people may present with, the stress that they may be experiencing from pain. We know uh, after looking at our data for about 10 year period, that there's one in five or one in four reports of people that present with dis severe distress related to pain that doesn't improve. In fact, it gets worse. And those trends have remained the same. And so through the integration of social determinants of health, we may actually be in a better position, both clinically and also nationally and, and internationally through collaborations to come up with improved models to respond to complexity of which acknowledge people's cultural diversity and lived experiences alongside the symptoms and problems that they're that they're telling us 
that matter to them. Thank you, Barb. I thought I just might make, put a question um, to Dulce and, and Ryan, um, just for some of the people that have, have joined us um, today on the webinar. It just might be interesting to get your reflections on how you deal with being a member of the community, having a powerful voice for that community, and also being a, a researcher. Um, I think that would be really interesting. Uh, Dulce, can I start with you? Sure. And um, being a researcher and being part of the community is um, something that has that is gives me privilege because and also gives me purpose. I um I feel myself that I really want to serve my people. I say it that way and I want to improve it. I not only am part of the community, I also suffer some of the things that they also suffer in in in, in certain way. Uh, and and that makes me more more sensitive to what they mean and what they and what they are seeking. And so it gives me it, it puts me in a privileged situation and at the same time I have to be conscious that I I don't uh, I cannot assume and I cannot pretend that all of them should uh, praise me and, and want to help uh, and want to participate in my studies. I have to be respectful of, of all that. Uh, of of their position, um. So mainly, mainly, my answer will be: I I feel myself in a privileged situation, and in a in a situation also that I want to serve to serve them, and help them through my profession and through research. Thank you, Dulce. Ryan. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think Dulce perfectly articulated and captured. Um, pretty much the same um, sentiments. Um, what I will add is the, uh, uh, my husband calls me a pessimist, but th there is a slightly negative side to it as well. So um, coming from a very big family, um, to put things into perspective, 250 strong Lebanese family, all based in Sydney, um, we have been touched by many um, chronic health conditions, including cancer, including neurological conditions. And I myself live with a uh, chronic neurological condition. And it can, having this um, platform and, and all this knowledge can be quite um, uh, frustrating at times when people come to you from, from the community or from your family and you can't do much to help them other than explain what their results mean, um, but you can advocate for them. So that's the positives. Um, also, I, I will touch on, I don't think I have the right word for it, but um, since I've started to become more vocal on this topic and, and working in this research field, I have been approached by many other researchers wanting my advice, wanting me to be part of the team. And so that's something that I need to be mindful of, that I am one person and that I cannot take on all the wonderful research studies. Um, but what I can do is refer them to other um, fantastic academics who are also identify from cold communities because we do exist, we are out there um, and we are more more than prepared to work with the research teams but yeah just to be mindful of how much I can take on as an individual um, because I can't solve all the problems um, faced by my community. Yeah. So there's a, there's a question um, that's come about the panel's view on um, technology mediated um, methods of capturing patient data such as patient diaries. Who would like to take that one? For sure, I'll jump in and I'll respond. Okay, absolutely. Respond. I think the role of technology in the future is um, going to be a game changer. And we've got the opportunity to do machine learning, harvesting data, looking at thresholds. Um, I can't see reasons why. In fact, there's already methodology about researchers that have analysed their own reflexive diaries during their research process. And in fact, that's assisted them in understanding why they've used certain paradigms or not. Um, 
but when you think about it at a meta level, and there are private companies that are already interrogating big data sets, um, and but but I suppose alongside that, it raises fundamental issues about data sovereignty, patient autonomy, choice informed consent. So our ethical approaches to these key big questions should not be dismissed, but they absolutely need to be addressed at the same time as technology progresses. Thanks, that's a great answer. And we've also got a question about, you know, how we look at subgroups. And, and I guess another way of looking at it is how we look at intersectionality, because uh, culture and language is a backdrop, but there is many uh, different ways. You know, we have gender, we have um, sexuality, we have age. Um, how how do we methodologically make sure that we we really capture those dimensions? And I think it might speak a little bit, Barb, to the social determinants of health question. So, would you maybe like to comment? Yeah, absolutely. A grand, really great question. Thank you. Um, one of the risks of dealing with population-based data and big data is that we're masking heterogeneity. And so picking up the earlier point, we must not forget that every patient that comes through our doors, every family member, every community member, they're unique, they're different. That diversity needs to be respected at an individual level. However, at a population level, I suppose what we're doing also in Peacock is overcoming these traditional challenges for culturally and linguistically diverse groups or any major subgroup within a population by looking at different ways to overcome small sample sizes and problems with single um, institution research. So what we're doing uh, is establishing a health equity program and a commitment to um, developing the evidence base in relation to that in collaboration with key groups. For example, we have uh, recently used a new classification approach to not look, when we look at all the data across Australia, 30% of people that access specialist palliative care services prefer to speak a, a language other than English. If we only did the analysis using that approach, we'd be limited. So what we've done is use there's a meta approach where we're pooling together culturally and ethnically similar groups through a standardised approach and we are looking exactly at intersectionality. And what we're finding is looking at function at episode start of palliative care. Those that are older adults, older, older, 75 years or older, those that are born in Asia or Middle East and North African countries, and those diagnosed with neurological disease are at risk of poorer outcomes compared to native born residents in Australia. Um, and, and so there, so the intersectionality is key. Um, and also population-based approaches. Thanks, Trish. Great. Well, look, this is, we're really coming to really the, the, the end of the conversation. And I, I thought I would just um, ask the panelists to give one, you know, take-home message uh, for the audience. Um, thank you so much to everyone who's participating here tonight. Um, and, and can I start with you, Michelle? Yeah, sure. Um, I think especially coming from um, Dulce's work around the telenovelas, I think it's really important to take the time um, with people to understand their values and beliefs and then tailor according to those values and beliefs. So short and sweet. Thank you, Michelle Dulce. Mine will be um, use stories to, to, to help people understand um, and to, to help. And, and all, the main message will be take into account family caregivers, keep them in mind, in, both in research and when you are caring for patients. Uh, family caregivers are your allies, so uh, help them as well and listen to them. Thank you, Trish. Thank you. Thank you, Dulce. Ryan? Um, I guess I'd leave you with the point, um, do not underestimate the power that you have to make change for generations to come by, um, you know, whether your research is going to improve health literacy in these uh, populations or improve health outcomes, this will have intergenerational impacts for years and years to come. Thank you, Ryan. And Bob. Thank you. 
patient reported outcomes, caregiver outcomes, listening to the voices of the people that matter and should shape our services, do this in collaboration and use a health equity lens to achieve positive change. Well, what an amazing panel, what powerful uh, messages for us to take home. Uh, thank you so much to the audience. Um, uh, uh, Tim Luckett placed a link for translated patient reported outcome measures in the chat box. Please access that. Um, thanks so much, Jill, for um, organizing us. And uh, just leaves me to thank the panel and also in Palliative Care Week, thanks to everyone uh, for all the important work that they do to help people living with um, chronic illness and those who are um, aging. And next week is Reconciliation Week in Australia, this week's Palliative Care Week. So as we move into next week, I think we also have some important messages to advance the care for our First Nations people. So thank you so much, everybody.